Let me share with you, people in this magnificent auditorium, a couple of facts about me that you may or may not take into account as you listen to my story. Now, firstly, I am a designer, but not just a designer, but a reframing designer. More about that later. And at our reframing studio, there's 10 of us designing the stuff, the things, the products, and the services that you may encounter in your daily lives. Secondly, I'm Dutch. I am from Amsterdam. And at this moment, I can perceive prejudices and perceptions crystallizing over your heads very clearly. It must be the Amsterdam thing. And I agree that there are two or three things about Amsterdam that are inducive to pre-conceptualization. But I can assure you there's nothing wrong with me. I know that because I visited the United States last winter and applied for an I-94W visa waiver document. Question one, are you insane? Answer, yes or no. <laughs> and they let me in. So that goes to show you that there's nothing wrong with me. I am free of mental disorder and of moral turpidity. And how lucky I am because epidemiological research shows that in the United States and also in my country, one out of every four persons per year may develop symptoms that could be labeled as mental. And what a big risk for Ted to bring over Americans and Dutch people to speak here, because obviously these statistics are not supposed to have effect in the Russian Federation. So as long as you don't travel to the Netherlands or the American, there, there's nothing wrong with your sanity. And it also means that you probably don't have any idea what it is to experience something like auditory hallucinations or a paracousia in scientific lingo, hearing voices or sounds that are not there. And that's why I uh, try to hey, record. Watch out, you. You know what Record a couple you. of these uh, sounds. We've you, haven't we? And as you can hey, hear, listen to sometimes us. there are two of them and they're you know attacking you and you mocking don't. you. And sometimes there's only one. You know, but you? in any case, these things are not your friends. They try to destroy you and destroy your lust for leaving your house and thereby are threatening your social life. So I hope that that demonstrates to all you sane people in the audience how difficult it is to concentrate on what I am saying if I have to compete with these voices. And I'm also very interested to find out how our poor simultaneous translator in the aquarium over there has dealt with these voices. But in any case, we are designers. So I thought to myself, we can solve that. That's not a problem at all. We found out that these voices are actually not all over the brain, but actually are residing in a particular area. And those of you who received medical training will know that the brain has an area over here, which is called the Wernicke area. And right next to it, there's an area that we call Tanganskia. And then if you take a pathway, Tverskia, right into there, you will arrive at the Kremlin. No, Broca. Broca, of course. That's where the voices are. So the next step on our way to a Nobel Prize for curing Paracosia was to design a game, an app, that involved a task that would be processed in exactly the same area that was squatted by the voices. And essentially, the game would tell the voices, move over, this brain ain't big enough for the both of us. So the games involve simple things like matching pairs of words or tapping the amount of syllables that uh, appear in the word. And uh, the app will give you feedback on how you're doing. And also, if you fail, it will stimulate you to keep going. Now, the game is called Tamstam, which is Dutch for taming voices. And although Tamstam is a reality, the story I just told you is a fantasy. It's a designer's fantasy in which the designer is claiming all the fame. And there's two reasons that the thing is a fantasy. It's first of all a fantasy because 
uh, the app is not going to cure any voices at all. Instead, it's going to enable people to cope with voices. These voices are not there all the time, so it's fair enough. They pop up. So if you have the smartphone in your pocket, you can defend yourself, you can go out, you can take the train, you can go to your friends, and nobody will think it's strange that you're staring into your phone or even talking to it. The second reason why it was a fantasy is that our contribution to the app uh, is, is limited. And also, we don't know anything about brains and psychiatry. And the initial idea that hallucinations could be cured or, or at least coped with with a, with a word game came from um, uh, psychiatrists who knew what they were talking about. So a product like that has many, many parents, and all of them deserve credit. But in the end, it becomes very blurred as to who contributed what. And it is though it is the creation of one multidisciplinary anatomy. But the opportunity for designers to contribute to big, serious issues is real. And you do that not by staying in your own silo, aiming at stardom, but by taking on theoretical and hypothetical constructs of visionaries, researchers, and philosophers, and teaming up with relevant professionals and jointly try to accomplish the behavioral changes that are so necessary to save this poor, expiring planet. So my hope is that by the end of this talk, all the designers in this room will stand up and take their portfolios with shiny gadgets and salt dispensers and door handles and tear them up and throw them in the waste bin. Because the designer is equipped with this job because he or she is able to empathize with all the other professionals in the team and bring them together into an inspiring amalgam, a narrative. But big issues also meet big competition. And this opposition is fueled by preconceptions and prejudice and is the result of not thinking in terms of a greater whole. It's a clear case of failure to perceive expanded reality. And that is what the reframer will contribute to expand reality and thereby making sure that the inspiring narrative also embraces the preconceptions. And we research relevant driving forces that will craft the new future context, and then establish what potentiality will be available in that new context, and how these relate to the preconceptions. So let me give you an example of how we are dealing with prejudice and preconceptions about a big issue that we're currently involved in, and tell you about our role as reframing designers in a multidisciplinary team working on the mental health care system, so not just a product, but the entire system. And as I already told you, there are many, many more people in need for treatment than most people are aware of. And these people are hearing voices, they are uh, perceiving conspiracies, they are, think they are being subjected to mind control, they consider suicide, they see demons, all these bad things. And in the Netherlands, we have enough money to treat about 5 to 7% of the population and certainly not 25%. And although money is already scarce, we are spending a lot on bureaucratic control and uh, other measures. And most of the rest is going into research on new technical approaches for treatments, and there is increasing controversy about that because the results of that research are at best ambiguous, and some will benefit and some won't. And once accepted, the treatments will find their way into the DSM-5, which is the holy book that describes all the treatments that will be applied to you in case you are diagnosed. But the fact that a treatment scores better than a placebo does not mean that it works for you. It means that it works for an aggregated group. And also, if it has been proven scientifically that something does not work better than a placebo, then it doesn't mean it wouldn't work for you. Because patients are individuals and not aggregated groups. And the reframer will untangle these juxtapositions. And what we came up with is the following analysis of the way care systems interact with patients. And there are two ways to approach somebody who's in need for treatment. Either you tell them, 
you are going to do this, or you ask him, what do you have in mind yourself? And you're going to do this is obviously a top-down approach. And people who contribute in top-down approaches are usually very few. There's just a few of them. And they're able, professional, and very reputed. And the bottom-up contributors are basically anybody else, the rest of us. And the approach, in approaching people, we may reach big audiences over here or small audience over there. And reaching out to big audiences usually means you are using a highly experiential and maybe even fun message. While if you have a small audience, you're probably lecturing in a rigid and institutional way. And when you ask yourself what is in it for me, the revenues or whatever is communicated to a mass audience are easily shared among bitter groups, while um, the approach that you, leads to small audiences usually goes into the pockets of small elites. So as you can see, we have at our disposal four quadrants over there, and we're going to check out how the uh, mental system fits. So let's position it. And I have to apologize for the cartoonesque and slightly exaggerated rendition, but this is conventional medical healthcare talking to you. You, patient one, two, three, our scanner has shown that your Broca area is not wired as it should be. Eat this benzobutanil twice a day. Go to room 34, report to Dr. So-and-so and undergo cortex electrostimulation. Come back next Monday, eight o'clock, and no alcohol. Otherwise, your insurance company will not reimburse your costs. So let's check. That's procedural, top-down, limited user input, and all the money will go to Big Pharma. So mental care lives over there. And now we have another guy. Hey, John, how you doing? How's the wife? How's the kids? Hey, I can see you're gaining weight. But don't worry about that belly. We can have it fixed in no time. Meanwhile, have a frappuccino. And while you consider to upgrade to our year pass, offering you numerous benefits. So this is the spa or the, the, the health club approaching you and reaching out to you from this planet. Mass audience, high experiential. And then we have a guy, boy, printing these Self-help instructions is getting expensive. We have to print them and distribute them and, and store them somewhere. But I find a way around it. I scan them and put them on our website as a PDF. And I made them available to everybody, charging the same amount as for these printed booklets. So this is a first generational e-health supplier that shall be confined in this planet for not offering any better uh, um, experience than the, the, the conventional mental health care. Maybe he reaches more people, but the sad experience they're offering is a shame. And finally, we can hear a rocket taking off. And in no time, it blasts away from our galaxy, away from brain disorders, away from medicine, and away from what is impossible to a person because of this or that disorder. And as planet E-Health fades away in the rearview mirror, the rocket reaches a new planet, hitherto unknown to mankind. And everything the cosmonaut is saying will be recorded and relayed back to us. And here's a transcript of what he just said. Hey there, Sue, what can we do for you today? Do you seek relief from some disorder? Or are you launching with us a new promising app treating depression? Or do you want to try out some new face-to-face -face approach for anxiety? Or comment on a treatment from the same disorder that you successfully done away with and managed yourself? Please go ahead, because anything you will do here will teach us and make us smarter in assessing what works with whom and with. And this guy clearly shouts like he is from a completely other planet. And this rocket is fueled by frustrations of two professors who are reputed psychiatrists, uh, Jim van Oss and Philippe de Les Paul. And they state that the current system 
is inadequate and they use much, much stronger words than that themselves. And they maintain that what we call mental disorders are in fact normal symptoms that may happen to anybody in this room. And what aggravates them to suffering is not the mental state, but societies as well as the person's own response to these systems. And this is why we are launching this rocket and putting the person formerly known as the patient in the driver's seat. But since the rocket's trajectory has been very speculative, the institutional planet was convinced the whole enterprise would self-destruct and end in an unknown black void. But now that we expanded the universe and revealed the new planet, that appears to be the perfect match where everybody contributes and everybody consumes and everybody may share in profits and everybody will be interacting in an engaging way. And all other goals that one may pursue, like reaching happiness, becomes people's own responsibility. Now, the new interactions that will make up this new mental health system will obviously not be designed by us. The way we prescribe treatments, the way we deal with patients and their relatives, um, how we finance, how we, how we ensure, how we complain, how we deal with feedback. The model tells us that all these things shall be provided by everybody, literally. But not every addition will flourish on that planet. And this is why we support the contributors by defining 10 affordances which they need to design into their contributions in order to make them compatible with life on the new planet. And at this point, I've been identifying myself to this galaxy and planet metaphor to a point that I feel like I'm morphing into some sort of mission control announcer, which may be appropriate for my closing line. Dear audience, our mission has changed. While we were attempting to rid persons of symptoms of disease, we shall be increasing on the new planet the people's ability to adapt and self-manage in the face of emotional, physical, and social challenge. And on the new planet, this mission has all the chances to take root because we are offering more opportunities to the mentally disordered, but also to practitioners, to scientists, to entrepreneurs. And in fact, opportunities are the main reason that this is an alluring planet. Because increasing opportunities, that is what human life is about. Thank you.